Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, hello again, Sandy Moss here, and I've got uh, a few things to show you today that uh, are a little bit different. Uh, the first item that I have is, I guess you'd call it a cane or a pointer or something like that. This is in the form of a, of a regular walking stick, <clears throat> but clearly smaller. And I think it was made as a pointer for someone to point up, you know, items on a blackboard or on a screen or something like that. But the interesting thing about it is it's made of shark vertebrae. So what's happened is that a shark was caught, and this is a small shark, it's, its total length was probably two feet long or something like that, probably from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, my guess it's from what, what's called a black tooth reef shark. Uh, or black fin reef, reef shark, excuse me. Uh, and the animal was uh, cut up, the meat removed, and then the backbone was taken and dried. And eventually the backbone was uh, threaded on, onto a metal rod to give it some support. And a knob was added at the top, and a little tip was added at the bottom to make this sort of child size, size cane or as they say, a pointer. Uh, and I'd like to say something about it because sharks are, <coughs> sharks are one of my areas of interest. <coughs> and um, sharks belong to a group of animals known as the chondrichthys, which means cartilaginous fish. That is, they don't have bone in their body, rather their skeleton is made of cartilage. But that cartilage is sort of ossified. It's really not ossified, it's not bony but it has calcium salts deposited in it to make it hard. So this, uh, this vertebral column, when it's been dried, is, is pretty hard and stiff, although it's got a metal rod in the middle here. Uh, and some of these sections of it can rotate. It's not completely uh, tied to the, to the rod inside. And if you look very closely at this, you can see that there are two sets of, of, uh, of holes two on the top of each vertebrae, and if you turn it around the other side, there's two on the bottom side of the vertebrae. And these are the supports for cartilages that stick up as, as arches, like this, over top of the vertebrae, and also what we call hemal spines that protect the blood vessels underneath the vertebrae. Uh, and those never become calcified, so that cartilage withers and dries up when, when the animal is dried. Whereas the, the vertebral centra, the, the bodies of the vertebrae, uh, still remain very hard and calcified. Now, it's said that the, the sharks don't have bones. That's really not true because if you go and, and do the scientific studies on these vertebrae, you'll find places at the bases of each vertebrae where there's a little tiny bit of a group of cells which make bone, which are, they're called osteocytes, sites, meaning cells which produce bone, but not very much. But it's interesting because it tells us that the modern sharks, which don't have much bone at all, have the genetic capability to make bone. In other words, they're derived from ancestors which were bony, and now they've lost that ability to make bone, and so they're cartilaginous. Among other things, that means a lot of them continue to grow through their life, the large ones certainly do, uh, and it also means that because they're cartilaginous, they don't really have the problems of breaking bones because cartilage is much more flexible. It's, it's like the stuff in your ear, very flexible uh, material. So this is a, a, a cane made of shark vertebrae. I'm kind of critical on it because I look at it closely and I see that this bottom section here was put on backwards. That should be rotated 180 degrees. So the, the person who made this didn't do it uh, correctly. Now the other thing about this that's sort of interesting to me is that the, the top knob here and these dark rings that sort of uh, separate segments of the vertebral column and also give it a little, a little uh, contrast in color, these are made of baleen. That is, the material that, that uh, whales, some kinds of whales use to strain food out of the water. And this top uh, knob here is made of, of baleen, and each of these darker rings is made of 
baleen. One of the things about baleen, it's the material that's the same as your fingernails. Uh, it's called keratin. And uh, baleen is uh, attractive to certain insects when it's fresh. And what happens with baleen is that when it's, uh, when it's first exposed to air before it's gotten good and dry, these insects, which are small moths, land on it, they lay their eggs on it, and the eggs hatch into larvae, and the larvae eat that baleen. So they, they damage the baleen. And if you look very closely right here, you can see in this top knob there's an area that's been eaten away. So the larvae that hatched from an egg uh, ate through the baleen and came to the top and then transformed into the adult and flew away. So uh, that's damage. But the uh, people who work with baleen or try to identify baleen in, in antiques and what I'd like to see that, they call that good damage because that proves that it's baleen and not some other material. So this one, because it's got that, that insect damage on it, we know is, is baleen. Now I have a pair of jaws from sharks here. These are from two different species of sharks. This one is from what's called a blue shark. It's a very common shark. Actually, in all tropical and subtropical oceans of the world, we have it off the east coast here. It's off the west coast. I've seen them off New Zealand. They're, 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 they're just about everywhere in the world. And they're the largest of the, the, the let's say, the the largest populations of larger sharks. These get up to maybe three or four hundred pounds, uh, but anything human size or larger, you know, 150 pounds is considered a big animal. And it's been estimated that blue sharks are one of the most abundant large uh, vertebrates in the world, excepting the human species. We're, we're way more than any other uh, group of large animals. So this is a blue shark. And this one is a different sort of shark. This is called a poor beagle shark, like poor beagle dog. Uh, and it is related to the mako shark and the white shark, the one of man-eater fame. Uh, and uh, so these are, are fairly different sharks uh, in terms of how closely they're related to each other. Uh, and what I'd like to, to mention about these is their teeth now, as I said, uh, the animal is made of, of cartilage. This, this jaw is really cartilage, but it has the calcium salts laid down in it around it. It's been dried, so the cal calcium is withered inside and le leaves this hard, thin shell, which, which is all that's left of the material that originally was in the jaw. But if you look inside this jaw here, you may be able to see that the teeth are sort of folded back on each other. There's, there's a row of teeth that go back. I can see one, two, three, four teeth in a row here, and there will be some smaller ones we can't even see, and some that haven't developed yet way underneath that. So there may be eight or ten teeth in a line here. We call those tooth rows. And the teeth grow down at the bottom and push the ones ahead of them up. And so as the teeth grow and also the cartilage bed they're riding in uh, is reabsorbed out here, these teeth fold up and become functional when they get erect to be used in, in feeding and ultimately they fall out. They, the, uh, the, the binding to the, to the bottom here essentially disintegrates and they lose the teeth. So these teeth are continually folding up during the life of a shark. Uh, and it's sort of interesting because for a long time people uh, didn't really think they did that, but if you stop and think about it, they, it makes sense. First of all, as the shark gets bigger, the teeth have to get bigger in order to keep a full mouth. Uh, and that means the teeth have to grow, but once it reach, they reach the final size, they're not going to grow anymore. So what happens is they fall out and a bigger one replaces it. And if you look at the teeth below and you count them and, and measure them, you find out that the one behind is larger than the one in front here. So they're, they're accounting for the, the growth of the jaw by getting bigger as they go. Back when I was Working with these things, I devised a technique to actually figure out how fast they replace their teeth. And it sort of was surprising because a, a young shark or a small shark this size turns out to replace every tooth in its mouth an average of once every seven days. So they're going through a whole new set of teeth every seven days. That slows down as the shark stops growing faster as it gets older. And so a big shark may replace its teeth maybe once a month or maybe once every six months but it's still 
a surprising kind of finding. So these, uh, these animals don't have any problems with cavities or whatnot because they keep throwing their, their teeth off. By the way, this, this animal here, which is a poor beagle shark, I said is related to the mako sharks. And if you look at it closely, one of their defining characteristics is each tooth at the base here has a little sub-tooth. There's a little prong, a little cusp. So there's really three cusps, two small ones and a big one. And that's typical of this species. If you see a shark with that, it's going to be either this, uh, this uh, poor beagle shark or one of its uh, relatives, uh, or I think sand tiger sharks or another one which had that, those uh, extra prongs on their teeth. And this is a, uh, an unusual shark for a, a number of reasons, but we don't have time to go into that about it now. But maybe another time we can talk about the sort of the behavioral and the physiological distinctions between a couple of species of sharks like this.